Okay, great. Welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us again. I'm really excited about this. Uh, this week is Quark Express, or, or Quark Express, pronounce it how you want, tips and tricks. I think there's probably about a thousand tips and tricks for Quark Express. I think I may have come across 500 of them. I've probably tried 200 of them, uh, and I probably use 20 of them daily. But today we can really only share four or five. So I apologize for that. There's, there's much, much more we could talk about. Before we go any further, I'd say that the biggest tip for any kind of software is knowing what it's for. Uh, Quark Express, Quark Express is a final layout publishing program. It's for desktop publishing, even if you use it on a laptop, that's okay. Um, which means that it's the last thing you do before it goes to the image setter or a digital press or an ebook or a PDF uh, or even a website. And the things that Quark is good at are the things for that. So it, it can do some other things. It, it can take the place of some other software. But when you're bringing in your pictures, I use Capture One, you might use Lightroom, you might use Digicam, you might use NeoFinder, you might use DxO, and that's great. And if I'm originating artwork, uh, I used to use Illustrator, a great program. I, I now use Vector Styler, which I think is even better. You might want to use Affinity Design, that's okay, it's not a problem. Those are great programs for originating uh, line art and vector art. Uh, and if you want to do image editing, then uh, Photoshop or GIMP or Affinity Photo or Pixelmator are all great for those. But when it comes to, to getting things together at the end, Quark, that's where Quark excels. So the, the, the first thing I want to talk about is, is something that people uh, often ask me about, and I've, I've forgotten it a few times and that is simply people say I want an image I want a page preview where I can see the pages so this is the the brochure I've been working on I'm still working on it. it's not going to print yet I'm hoping to go to print tomorrow um, what I've done is I've split my screen uh, let me just get over here and, and show you that so I've, I've split my screen uh, using window uh, screen split and what I've done is, you can probably see if I can move my finger to the right place, uh, is instead of typing in a percentage, I've typed in T, just T, and it, it puts up thumb. And what happens is it shows a thumbnail of, of, what, of your document. Now you can actually go much smaller, you can show many pages, if you type in 5%, you can show lots of pages. But what thumbnail does is it acts like the page layout uh, palette, you can move pages around. So if you want to move pages around, uh, then that's just a great thing. And it's, it's live, it will update as you work on the document. Of course, being live, it means it comes at a cost in speed. And all things like this, you've always got to think, uh, more features, more facility, uh, if I turn more things on, as it were, uh, it's going to get slower. And, and if you turn absolutely everything on, and I've got 15 other programs running at the same time, and are on quite an old computer, it's going to slow down. So be aware that working fast usually, or the computer working fast, usually means working better. Ultimately, the amount of time you're able to spend on refining things determines just how far you can go. But my, my second uh, uh, feature, which I think is amazing, and most people don't seem to care about, is output sharpening. So this is a, a picture of a heron which I, I shot during lockdown at the park near us and it's shot with a handheld uh, manually focused 500 millimeter lens uh, uh, at 1 on 2000. Uh, and this is a mirror lens, you, you can't autofocus them. And getting that sharp, uh, I, was, I was really quite pleased about that. But as all you print people know, when you put it into uh, offset print in, into CMYK or mono, when you're using a half-tone rendering, or even if you're going to a laser print or a digital press, when it comes out, my ultra-sharp image, which I'm sh sorry, it's not as sharp on Zoom because Zoom does, does blurs everything, but my ultra-sharp image is going to come out as a little bit blurry. Well, the answer to this was worked out years ago, and it's called output sharpening. I used to use a facility uh, which I bought for Photoshop called PhotoKit Sharpener. Uh, Nikon used to do something called Nick Sharpener, which has now uh, been sold to DxO, and you can buy that separately. Um, 
And, and there are various other things to do, but you could buy boxing into and I did. But, but what output sharpening is, is a very small amount of unsharp masking applied to the image in its final state. If you change the size of the image or change its effective resolution, not its original shot resolution, then you've got to do it again. And, and I used to do this in, in, in Photoshop, uh, and I would end up with 20 or 30 different versions of the image on my hard drive, all with names like version 17A, or Heron quite close by a little bit, or uh, 300 by 700, uh, don't use this one, use another one. And it's a nightmare. And then when you try to, to, uh, to, to tidy it up, of course you delete the one you actually want. Much better to do it in uh, the final stage, which is when it's actually in the layout at the correct size. Now, uh, how you do this is you go to the image, you go to the image adjustments for your image, and that 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 little half disc, I've put that there. That's not part of Cork Express. That's just to show the difference. Um, and what you do is is you divide for normal viewing distances. If you want to do billboards and things, then then. Uh, there's a slightly different formula which you can look up, but but you divide the resolution at size. So check at the bottom of the screen in the measurements what the resolution reported is. This is not the same as the shot resolution, which is almost always 300 dpi. Uh, you divide that by 400 and uh, round it to the nearest pixel, uh, but make it at least one. Uh, pixel. And that's the radius you're going to apply. You haven't got to do anything else on that unsharp masking. Let's go in just a little bit closer. Um, on the left is, is not sharpened, on the right is sharpened. And you're probably saying, I can't tell the difference. That's absolutely correct. You can't tell the difference properly on a screen because what you're doing is you're working to the difficulties of offset. And your screen can't display that. So you've got to know that it works. I've got to say, the first few times I did it, I was very scared. But one day I was absolutely thrilled when uh, we'd done an annual report, we'd done a, a, a cover for this uh, with a UV spot uh, in order to give it real sharpness. But we, we'd worked on the, on the output sharpening and to the point we were really satisfied. And uh, a, a local reporter from the local newspaper walked in and he looked at it and he, he immediately said, how did you get it that sharp? That was just a, a wonderful moment because it looked as sharp as a photograph. And output sharpening, people don't do it. Why not? Well, if you do do it, well done. But, but generally they don't do it because although they tried it a couple of times and it was better, the cost in terms of time and the annoyance of having all those versions is just too much. Quark Express, you just, you just add it on as one final stage right at the end. Don't, don't bother doing it earlier. Uh, this is the last thing you want to do to the pictures. If you're going to resize them, even in Quark, you've still got to change that adjustment, though you haven't got to do a different version. But this is one of my absolute favorite things. Um, so just to reiterate that, at normal distance, so normal viewing distance, normal viewing distance is when the, uh, the diagonal of the page is pretty much the same as the distance from the page. So that's, that's a normal viewing distance. If you're, if you're European and looking at an A4 sheet of paper, you're going to look at it from about 35 centimeters. For, if you've got American sizes, it's, it's uh, very slightly different. But uh, at normal distances, that's what you were usually planning for, the radius for unsharp masking uh, is the resolution of the image at the used size divided by 400. Let's move on. Well, go the opposite direction, and something which I, I, I learned from a, a, some designers called Rare Company in the UK. If you're Rare Company watching, thank you very much. You're amazing. I hope you're still doing great business. Um, we were doing annual reports uh, in, in the arts, uh, and we were often given only just enough photographic material, and they, and they came to, to, to pitch their, their design for this, and they used a lot of, of blurring to, uh, to give... A, a suitable background uh, to an image or, or a page face which still had all the right colours and, and, and reflected it but uh, was clearly not just repeating the same thing. And I, I love to use this a lot. Uh, very simply, to use it in Quark Express, again, you're just going to go to, you make a copy of the picture, which I've done in, in that, that line, 
And then you apply a, a, a massive amount of blur to it. You can see how much blur I've got on my image adjustments there. And then what I'm also often doing is just uh, lifting or lowering the curves so that it, it works well. And what I've also done here, of course, is, is combine uh, the, uh, the box with uh, text converted to vector and then just combine that so that it, it shines through. But so many graphic problems are solved with sharpening or blurring. And there's, there's way, way more things you can do there. And in fact, a, a very large number of the plugins you can buy for Photoshop, I used to buy them like candy, uh, actually, all they're doing is just combining uh, a, a basic set of filters. And, and using those filters, you can go a long way. We don't have time to go a long way today because we need to go on to something else. Now, something else which has been the bane of my life since 1990 uh, is maps. Um, if you want to upgrade a publication about a particular facility, putting a proper map, a walkway map, is one of the best things you can do. The problem is that, that actually having drawing maps where you've got to draw all the... Uh, uh, all, all, all the different sides of the street. It's really tedious. It's tedious. It was tedious in Corel Draw in 1990, which I thought I was using it. It was tedious in Illustrator, uh, and it was tedious in Quark Express. Up until the blend modes came in. And, and what I've done here, so these, these are just, let me just have, uh, get close to that. Um, if you can see, I've gone blue, but it hasn't. If you can see, I've got a double line there, which is 12 point. So double line, thick double line, nothing else. But what Quark has got, which is not obvious, and it had been there for a long time before I noticed it, is that you can give the gap a different color and a different blend from the line itself. So I've, I've, I've made the lines black, but the gap white. Now, if you do not make the gap white, this doesn't work. So if you're trying it and it doesn't work, that's the most likely thing. And then you either put on, uh, if you want to have two roads intersecting, like on, on, on let me get that on there. Uh, is it gone? No. There we are. Okay. Um, if, you, if you want to have two lines intersecting like that, so that it makes roads across roads, you just do lighten for the, the gap and lighten for the main text. And what that's going to happen, the, the main line, what's then going to happen is that where they cross, it will take the lightest. I actually use screen on here, uh, which kind of works as well, but I probably should have used uh, lighten. If you want to have one road over another road, for example, a bridge or a tunnel, then just swapping lighten and uh, darken or, or, or screen and multiply does the same thing. And that's... Uh, it's just a little illustration of, of where you can go with these, these blend modes. These blend modes are not just for blending photographs. And you may have kind of looked and thought, well, what's the point of this? I can do much more than this in other programs. Actually, there's a, there's a logic to it about how you can make one thing interact with another thing without having to actually combine lines, which is, is tedious. And then when you want to edit it later, it's even more tedious. Um, adjusting the roads uh, around where I, I live and work. I happen to live opposite from where I work, it's very nice. And, and uh, every few weeks, it's uh, a new road layout. And so we would have to change the layout every few weeks if we were doing that. Uh, if you've done it all so that it's kind of final form, it's really annoying to change that. But these are just regular lines with a double line applied uh, and then the appropriate uh, lighten or darken. Now, if you uh, save that as a PDF and open it in Acrobat, it's great. Unfortunately, if you open it in Apple Preview, it won't work because Apple Preview, much as I love Apple, I've been using Apple for years, uh, uh, Apple Preview does not support the blend modes properly. It supports some of them, but not all of them. So what can you do? Well, you can output it as an EPS, and when Apple Preview converts that uh, from EPS to PDF, it gets it right. But that's a kind of tedious thing to do. What about this? Go to Composition Zones. So, so you just select all that. Go to Composition Zones, and 
convert to composition zone, make a composition zone, and then, without doing anything else, go back and do convert to picture. And what's going to happen is that uh, it turns out into an EPS. And so when you export it as a PDF, it's now been kind of uh, blocked out, and Apple will understand it correctly. Part of the model of that is if you're going to rely on doing fancy things, check them in the appropriate browser or PDF viewer or ebook viewer because not everything which claims to support everything really does. But I, I kind of brought that in because I remember having trouble with it before and I, I figured, how did I solve that? But I also want to talk about composition zones because if you've not been using them, they are absolutely amazing. So all you do with a composition zone is, is you, you select uh, a, an area of your, your, your layout and say, uh, make composition zone, I think it's edit, make composition zone, uh, and, uh, or create composition zone, and it will create a separate layout which you can edit separately. And you can work on this. And you can say, well, why would I want to do that? Well, for all kinds of reasons. If you're, if you're doing one of those uh, documents which are folded uh, so that you've got things in different directions, rather than keep turning your computer screen around, which is inconvenient, you can simply work on the relevant sections in composition sense. But it does much more than that. So um, I've got my same document here. And uh, what I've done is I've... Uh, Gone to, I've gone to that layout itself, and then I've, I've gone to, I've clicked, uh, right clicked on the screen, I've up, up, up here, yeah, so where my head is, good. Okay, I've right clicked on the screen, I've gone to advanced layout properties, and this then allows me to share that layout. And if I do that, if I can do it for all projects or just for this layout, um, it will then appear uh, in my content palette over here. Uh, which means I can just drag it wherever I want to, that's fine. But if I now click on edit on there, which is this one here, uh, it will open up this panel and it will offer me to make this external. And once you've made it external, it's a layout which can be edited by other Quark users on their own uh, computers, uh, maybe even via Dropbox, I've done this, uh, so you can have if you're doing a magazine and you've got somebody working on a particular layout or on an advert, they can work on that. And when they save it, you uh, can update in Quark Express uh, and it will come through uh, as uh, completely redone. And that allows you to, to, although this is like an enterprise feature and Quark's got some, some big enterprise software and some very, very big uh, enterprise customers, um, you've got this enterprise feature uh, on your own uh, computer and shared with your associates across the world. Um, and uh, at such a point it becomes possible to, to quickly scale up and have lots more uh, Quark licenses uh, or, or, or less. It means you, you, can, you can farm the work out and get lots of people working on something and then, then pull it back in and still have it all exactly fitting the specification. So, I, I really haven't done justice to composition zones. There's far more things they do. But if you've not tried this, then please do. If, if everything I've been saying to you is stuff you've known for years, well, that's fantastic. And I, I, I wish I could know what, what to say because there are so many things which, which people ask about which are not necessarily that obvious um, because Quark is very powerful. I talked about this before, about how all the different features interact with each other and often figuring out a problem is, is is figuring out how to make them interact so these are more linear program like word uh it's either this feature or that feature it's very frustrating that you want to do this thing in that feature and it it doesn't actually work and, and you know Quark, Quark interacts very nicely and, and an awful lot of, of the tricks I've discovered over the years are, are first thinking, what am I trying to accomplish? And then thinking, ooh, that's like this. I wonder what happens if you put it with that. Well, um, I just got a couple more which I want to talk about. And again, this is something if you know about it, you probably know it better than I do. But I love this. Um, 
It's a little, uh, used to be an extension by Gluon Software. If the guys from Gluon are there, you guys are fantastic, amazing, uh, some fantastic things you brought to Cork, but it was brought into Cork Express. And, and it's, it's called Image Grid. And all it is in utilities, Image Grid, and it'll come up with uh, this thing over here. If I, yeah, that's good. Um, it'll come up with that panel and uh, it will give you various options about importing images. Uh, and it, it's not infinitely powerful. You know, anything which is infinitely powerful is also infinitely difficult to use. But it's very powerful for putting images in different pages, uh, images in different places, getting all the images in, even just getting images into, a, a, into the program, into the pages, so you can look at them afterwards and you can get the file names or other information. And then you, you click on the process folder and it, it, it takes you to a, a finder window or, or, or Windows um, directory window and uh, it then allows you to select which that is and it processes all of the images in that folder and you can also process in the subfolder as well if you tick that button and then it will come out in this particular case like this in other cases it can be in all different ways now if that's not powerful enough for you and you want to do some really fancy things uh, you can then set some image styles and I haven't shown this on here which will simply place the right images in the right place on the page. So an image style, not image style, an item style. Item styles can actually specify the size and magnification and placement of the item on the page. And so you can have 200 images and you can just go da, 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 uh, and, and suddenly your whole layout's done. If any of you watched the, uh, the series I did for Quark a couple of years ago, we, we actually laid out an entire magazine uh, in eight minutes, and that was one of the tricks we used, was, was Image Grid, uh, and another one was using item stars to place things. Well, again, for Quark Classic users, and if you've been with Quark for a long time, you probably know this, but if, if you've not been using Quark for so long, or you've not used this before, it's an often overlooked feature, which is super step and repeat. And, and super step and repeat is, again, uh, a feature that came from outside Quark as an extension, was incorporated into it many, many years ago. But, but simply, you uh, tell it uh, how many how big, where, what rotation, you could even set the scale uh, and the transparency and other things, you can set where it rotates around and then bang it's done. Uh, but not only is it bang and it's done, but it's also undo and it's undone. So in, in this particular case, I've taken one of my double lines from earlier because I'm lazy and wanted to reuse it, and I've just applied the settings you can see on the screen here. And it produces this, this kind of beautiful thing. Now, like all features, you actually have to have a reason to use it. And, and just producing beautiful patterns isn't such great use for it. But this has got me out of trouble so many times. There are, are so many situations in which you want to do something like this. I've got one more bonus item for you, which is, is uh, it's not actually about Quark Express so much, but it, it's... Um, it's some rules for businesses, which I wanted to share with you. Because uh, a few years ago, we moved into a real wreck of a house. We got a, a fantastic deal on it, and we'd set money aside to, to fix it up. Uh, and uh, we found this guy who was absolutely amazing, and, and he, he represented himself as a handyman. But afterwards, it turned out he was skilled in pretty much everything. And in fact, he'd been quite a senior employee in a very, very large uh, corporation. And uh, a, a, another, even more famous organization had tried to recruit him as well. But he wanted to run his own business as a kind of handyman working out of his van. And over the course of about a year, he completely rebuilt our house from the inside. And when we eventually had to sell it, uh, we, we got vastly more than, we, uh, than we, we paid for it, and vastly more than we paid him for it. But I, I observed him in the way that he went about his business. And uh, he's an example which I want to share with everybody. And these are, I haven't asked for his permissions, so I'm not going to name him. 
Uh, he probably isn't watching. He's not really a court user. But, but uh, this is RPP's lessons for businesses. And number one is don't insult the client. If you're, if you're a handyman, or rather a, a very skilled master builder, uh, and you come into someone's house and they've done DIY, chances are it's rubbish. Don't insult the client. And that is something which in this industry is also very important. Somebody brings along the sketch their daughter did, don't insult the client. Secondly, give a realistic assessment of what you can do and can't do. Uh, if they brought along a scribble uh, and they say, can you make this into a logo, chances are that you can't. Uh, you're going to have to start again. And then another thing I learned from him was estimate the right price for the job. He'd look at the job and say it's going to be about this much. And, and when it wasn't, it was because the client, me, changed their mind. And so if the client changes what they want, itemize it on the bill and charge them for it. Uh, clients need to learn early that uh, it's not a free lunch. They can order whatever they like, but it will come on the bill. The reason restaurants give you an itemized bill rather than just meal is because otherwise customers claim that it's too much. It's only when you see all the things you've bought that you realize that actually you're getting a good deal. Um, well, um, emergency work has an emergency price. Now, obviously, plumbing stuff people are, are very concerned about, but there's all kinds of emergency work in our business. Uh, emergency work, emergency price, and be right up front with the client about that. Say, so, okay, this is outside my usual working time, that's going to be an emergency price. Now, another one I learned from him is that a client who sacks their last supplier and complains about them will do the same to you. Now, you've just got to be aware of that. I, I, one of my last contracts before I came to, to Belgium, now still in the UK, was with a very, very famous organization. As usual, I don't disclose who my clients were. And we knew beforehand that we were like the fourth or fifth people they brought in for this very big project to give some very expensive advice. And we worked out that, that if we spent more than so many weeks with them, it would be worth it. We would almost certainly get fired in the end. And we were. Um, Never complain about your costs of doing business to the client. Uh, it, it just sounds to them like uh, you don't know what you're doing. Um, indicate when you're going to work, but commit to the deadline. Um, a, a really useful piece of advice. Um, present the client with realistic choices along the way. No client wants a fait accompli. And represent the client's interests to third parties. We once found a guy, we were doing a, a, a replacing all of our computers and we found a guy who would negotiate for us with our suppliers and he earned or he got back far more than we paid him. We paid him a lot of money as a consultant but we still got back far more than we spent. And finally, always accept tea and a biscuit. So it's, it's the UK, tea and a biscuit is part of the thing but, but if the client wants to socialise, give them your time, they want to be your friend. If you're the client's friend, it will come back to you. So that's uh, tips and tricks for Cork Express, but also I just wanted to share some things I picked up from this guy who I just thought was such a magnetic person who's got so much to teach everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And we do have several questions here, and I will invite folks to either put questions now in the chat or through the Q&A. I'm going to start with the Q&A first. Uh, Martin, the question is, can the composition zones function be used on master pages? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'd have to check. My, my feeling would be yes. Certainly, if they don't, then you can convert them to pictures and put them on the master page. And you can convert that picture back into editable art with convert to native objects. You can keep doing this for as long as you want, and it never gets, it never goes away. So I, it's one of those things that I have to say, well, I, I need to check that. I don't recall having a problem doing it, but I can't actually remember doing it. So I would say, check it. If it doesn't work, convert to, finish what you're doing, convert to picture, put that in the master page. And if you realize you wanted to change it, just convert back and you can recompositions on it afterwards. So it's completely fluid in that way. Great, okay, another question. 
is there a way to reduce the image resolution displayed in Quark to save memory when working on documents with many, many pages? I think there used to be a way to do this in an older version, um, but it might have changed. So Martin, thoughts or experience on that? Yeah, it, it definitely used to be that. There was a, a preference called Greeking pictures. Now, a preference has now gone. Um, one thing you can actually do if, if you want to is, uh, which, which was much, much more common years ago when, when pictures were, were, were drastically larger compared to the computer capacity, is uh, actually take the pictures away on, on the drive and just use the previews in Quark. When, when you come to export it, it'll tell you that these pictures have gone, you just move them somewhere else. But in the meantime, it, 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 it should be a little bit faster. Um, I'm pretty sure that feature has gone. There may be a preference which improves it somewhat, but I would, I would go looking for other ways to speed things up. One way could be using, uh, I forget, there used to be a term for it. We used to do it all the time, and I've, I've forgotten what it is. But, but uh, one way would be to actually just uh, move the images aside so Quark, Quark can't see them anymore. And then when you're ready, just bring them back in and update them. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that particular feature is now gone. Okay, a couple of other questions here. Can you explain clipping paths? Ooh, yeah. So you've got two things. You've got runaround and clipping paths. And on, on your, if you've got Quark Express in front of you, open it now and, and get some kind of an image. And if you go to the measurements, you'll see uh, clipping paths and runaround. And, and the, the runaround can pick up from the clipping paths. So look at the clipping paths, and it's going to offer you a number of choices, one of which is uh, white areas, well, it depends on the image a little bit, but, but for most images, white areas only. And if you press that, uh, it will do a, a, a cutout uh, around that image. Now, this is not the kind of cutout that you're going to be having people's nice hair. Uh, I used to have much nicer hair. It's kind of disappear but it's very curly my curly hair would not be good for that uh, but if you want to have something simply not overlapping some text that's fine you can also use the alpha channel if, if there's an alpha channel embedded in the image which you've put in through some image software then you can use the alpha channel uh, but you can also uh, edit the clipping path subsequently there's an edit clipping path thing and and it's in the menus and then you click and move those paths around I used to have a designer who could do these very quickly. Now, if you're not happy with the way Quark does that, because when you, when you create a clipping path using uh, white areas, uh, it's going to have, if it's a complicated image, it's going to have uh, hundreds of points, and you might not want to work with all of those. So instead, you can go, again, back to the menus, I think it's item, and uh, you can change the shape uh, and... The shape will normally be already square, but at the bottom there's like a kind of a funny shape thing. You change it to that, and you can now edit the box uh, by adding points and moving them around. And in fact, that's usually much more convenient. Once you've done that, if if you're happy with your, your now cutout thing, either using an alpha channel, which is, is by far the best way, or even a built-in clipping path. You can import a clipping path in if it's in Photoshop in a PSD file. Or you've done it with white space or you, you've clicked your own. You can now go to run around and pick it up from the same as clipping path. So I hope that, and that's a really fast explanation and we probably want to do it with, uh, by, by showing how it works. There's a lot you can do there. You can also, just interestingly, uh, convert your clipping path to a box. And so if you want to quickly vectorize uh, a, 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 an image which is essentially black and white, uh, or you want to vectorize into a silhouette, you can actually use that uh, create a clipping path by doing white spaces and then convert clipping path to box. You've now got a box, which is essentially a shape, which is in the shape of your image. So quite a useful thing to do. Uh, obviously, there are other specialist utilities to do that, but it's quite a useful thing. Okay, great. Uh, Martin, we've got a few other questions here, so we may run past our 40 minutes. 
Um, hope everybody can stick around. Um, can you show us um, where to turn on the rounded end cap of a line? Oh, I love this feature. Thank you for mentioning this. I, I, I can't show you right now because I, I can't actually access the computer. But if you go to edit, dashes and stripes, uh, so edit dashes and stripes, it brings up the panel for dashes, dashes and stripes. And then if you do uh, create a new dash or stripe, there's uh, end caps on there. There's also corners on there. And you can just turn those on to rounded, or you can even have like square or, or half uh, corners. And I absolutely love this. It's a fantastic feature. It, it, it's not included in any of the presets, but one of the first presets I, I usually make is this. You can also use this to do uh, to all kinds of other things, including uh, a line which has got a big dot at each end and a thin line in the middle. It's, it's a little bit of work, so I'm not going to show it now. But uh, I just find that so useful. So this is a, a hidden feature. In fact, I wish I'd thought about that to put it as a tips and tricks. I love it. Go to Edit, Dashes and Stripes, create a new dash or stripe. What you get is going to be slightly different. And then just turn end caps on as round. Right. A few other questions here, Martin. Is there a way to add a page turn effect to an HTML5 flip book? Ooh, um, can't remember. Okay, uh, I'm gonna jot I that I believe there down. was, but I haven't, done a, I haven't done a flip book for a couple of years. I, I kind of feel flip books are a little bit old hat, a little bit uh, skeuomorphic, which was the really big thing when the iPhone came out. And, and since then, people have moved away from that. Uh, but it, it, it certainly, I think, was a feature, but I, I would need to check that. But if, if you go into, I mean, you, you, you can see very easily if, if it's available. Okay, hang on, I'm scrolling through, I'm scrolling through. Um, is there a way to improve the quality of color gradients when exported as 72 DPI PNGs? Ooh, seven, I mean, 72 DPI is, is tricky. Uh, gradients have always been a problem. Uh, I, I remember doing a, a second set of cards for somebody, uh, playing cards, uh, years ago in CorelDRAW, which was, was regarded as being better for gradients than, than Illustrator was. And he wanted so many gradients, and when it came back, it was banded. And uh, yeah, uh, and he said, whoa, it's banded. I said, well, that's what I told you it would be. Essentially, the, the banding comes because of the difference between the resolution of your image setter or printer and the line screen uh, which you're using and the resolution of the image. And so the, the only way really to, to get this right is to have a high enough resolution of image setter uh, and or set a low enough line screen. Um, a 72 DPI image is going to give bending anyway if you're going to use it for print. If you're using it for the web, um, one of the better ways of dealing with this kind of thing is actually to put more different lines in your gradient. So a straight gradient from white to black is going to show bending on most machines. And it will show bending in different places depending on the particular screen used. But if you add more intermediate steps and control those, then it'll work much better. And there are, there are areas of color so uh, the black end, the eye doesn't really see uh, much difference there, and you won't get bending. Uh, and again, also the very light end, you, you tend to see it much more clearly in, 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 on print, but not on the screen. So I would go to the gradient setting and then set more carefully where those lines are, and even have them, have them going up and down. Uh, but gradients have been a problem in all software and for all processes since they first came out. People love them, uh, but it's an issue. If, it's re if you're really struggling with it, uh, for, for all kinds of reasons, if, it, if it's the, kind of the, the, the bad hair day perfect storm of a huge uh, area of, 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 of gradient, a somebody demanding the highest possible resolution and yet the image setter doesn't go that high and so on. 
what I'd often do is actually convert it. I I I I convert it to a a, a PNG file, bring it back in, and apply a, a Gaussian blur to it. Very cool with a Q. Um, is there an easy way to split a picture with a rounded border to make it go across a page? Um, a picture with a rounded border to make it go across a page. Um, well, it's easy to split a picture with a rounded border uh, by using, uh, you just create a, a square to chop it off uh, and uh, make a copy, make it do a square shape and then put the square shape over the picture so it, it blocks off what you don't want to see and then uh, use the, uh, the the boolean uh, chopping things and on the measurements panel now you've got little blocks of black box and white boxes on click the button bang it's gone do the same thing the other way around and you've split it into two uh, you shouldn't need to be to have to do that across if you've got a spread you can have a picture that goes across the spread anyway but I hope that answers the question and here's another is there a pdf preset for saving a pdf to a low file size without having to adjust a million different items in the pdf output output pop-up box right the, the screen pdf is the smallest one it's also rubbish and that's that's the problem about pdfs is is that uh, the smaller the file size, the the more degraded the images are. So if you go to the the, the option that you've got the options, you've got some presets. The one that says screen, that is by far the smallest file size uh, of the presets, but it's also the ugliest. Uh, and I, I've got to say, I, I never send that. Um, but if you're looking for really small, that's the way to go. If you want to make it really as small as possible, then I would say use the preset, so not, you, you use the options, uh, and, and then save it as a, an output style. You, you can save output styles and put them in there. Once you've done it, uh, it's right for you. Um, one thing I would share is, is that on the compression on the pictures in those options, it says high or low. And for years, I couldn't understand why my images look rubbish when I wanted them to look great, and were very large when I wanted them to be small. And that's because it's the compression is high. So in other software, it's often it's the quality which is high. So choosing high, good software, or sorry, good, good picture. Choosing low, bad picture. But in Quark, it's the compression which is high or the compression which is low. So choosing low compression gives you a larger file size and a nicer image. Choosing high compression gives you a smaller file size and a more degraded image. Okay, one last question here that I actually can answer. Um, someone is asking about um, Mac OS compatibility with Monterey. And this gives me a good chance to tease Quark Express 2022, which will be coming out sooner rather than later. And it will be compatible with Mac OS Monterey. So we've reached sort of our limit here. Um, I do want to thank everyone for attending. Um, I think it's fair to say this has been a very popular, fun session. Um, and we will look at doing some more of these. Um, so thanks everyone for your attendance, your enthusiasm. There have been some questions that have come through that I would qualify as, as maybe more support questions or general product questions as opposed to how do you do this or that to create better content designs. So I would say if you have some of those um, lingering questions, email us at info at quark.com so that we can capture that feedback. I mean, I've jotted down a lot of things. But um, if there's a particular product concern, question, issue, document that by emailing us at info at quark.com and we will have support reach out to you if you are an active Advantage member um, and we will certainly um, run this up the chain to product management. So 
Thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Have a great um, weekend. I guess I'll say happy Halloween. And if you are still looking um, for Quark Express 2021, we are still offering that 40% discount um, through the end of the month. So thanks, everybody. We appreciate you.